there, there are a couple of uh, skeptical questions that people sometimes ask, and let me try to address them. Um, one is the question of efficacy. As, as you know, there have been a lot of uh, doubts about whether aid works, whether development works. Um, Bill Easterly has raised a lot of these concerns, more recently Dempi Samoyo, uh, a Zambian economist, and I have to say these are legitimate questions. I think that it probably is true that the development community, humanitarian community, is oversold how easy it is to help people, and helping people truly is harder than it looks. Um, in southern Sudan, uh, which I just came back from, there is a real problem with uh, breeding dependency. Um, before that, I was in Zimbabwe, saw, um, for example, water projects from one of the major NGOs, uh, American NGOs, and uh, it, you know, was a, a well, a borehole that had been dug, uh, worked fine initially, and then a part broke. There wasn't a system to keep it repaired, and so that investment was lost. The borehole wasn't working. The well wasn't working. Um, you see an awful lot. Anybody who's traveled has seen a lot of projects that have gone awry. The other side of it is that anybody who's traveled has seen a lot of projects that have really gone unbelievably well, the Beatrices, and there are a lot of them too. And I think we're getting better at figuring out what kinds of projects work. Uh, they involve local ownership. They involve listening to people. Uh, grassroots efforts, I think, often... Uh, health, education, uh, empowerment efforts often have a better record than some other kinds of, of interventions. Um, and, um, you know, in the case of, of education, for uh, example, partly because there are more people who are spending time at the grassroots, partly because we are doing more listening, uh, because there's more rigorous work being done by development economists, I think we're learning that, you know, it's, it's often things we don't think of, like uh, deworming kids that'll get them into school cheaply. We don't think about deworming because, you know, kids at new school don't have worms. Um, we hope. <laughs> uh, um, in most of the world, in kids in school do have worms, and they mean you're more malnourished because food is going to the worms, not to you. Uh, you're more anemic. Um, you're more prone to be sick, and you miss a lot more school. Uh, deworming a child, one pill of albendazole will last a year. It's incredibly cheap, incredibly cost effective, and just a great way to get more kids in school. Um, in, in terms of adolescent girls, one thing that we're increasingly learning was that, you know, it was never really talked about because it was something of a taboo, but that uh, girls had trouble managing menstruation. And so they would stay home during their periods and would just get more and more behind and would eventually drop out. And there was a, a study that Oxford University did that just came out oh, a month or two ago um, that suggested that just providing girls pads, which is an incredibly cheap intervention, reduced absenteeism by half. Um, so I think we're getting more creative, learning better what works, and, um, uh, and um, so I, uh, uh, you know, I think we're getting a better handle on this, but I also think we need to acknowledge just how difficult it can be. Um, another question that uh, people often have is effectively, isn't this incredibly depressing, this world of trafficking, poverty? And I think it may be that one of the mistakes the development community, the humanitarian community has made is to focus on the wretchedness of it all. You know, that the emblematic picture of a poor country is some poor starving child with flies in the eyes or something. And that, uh, uh, I think that there is a real problem that this kind of thing turns people off and that it's important you know, not to cover up those very real needs, but also to emphasize that there is a real inspiring side to this as well. Um, that that girl I showed you, Long Pross, who'd had her eye gouged out. What you also need to know is that uh, in, uh, th that she was able to get help uh, because of uh, a woman called Somali Mam, a Cambodian woman who escaped the brothel and started an NGO 
two NGOs now to help girls get out of the brothels. And those brothel owners want to kill Somali. They've held guns to her head. They kidnapped her daughter. And she is out there every day expressing her humanity by helping girls get out of the brothel. And I just find that unbelievably inspiring and empowering. And in contrast, what I do find depressing is to come back here and you see people who have no greater expression of their humanity than to have the latest hot car or cell phone. That is what is depressing, not the world of international poverty, trafficking, whatever. And a final question is the one, why should I care? And it probably isn't one that would originate in this room because you, <laughs> you all care, you manifestly care, which is, you know, and your attendance here is evidence of that. But I think it is one that we need to think about and explore, and if there is to be a movement, you know, how we build those connections. And obviously one answer to that is that if you've seen a 13-year-old girl who's had her eye gouged out, you don't ask the question. And I think if we can get more people to travel and see these needs so that they become uh, real, then there can be much broader engagement. But there's another answer to it, and that has to do with what this does to us and how we benefit. Um, there's been a lot of work in social psychology about what makes us uh, happier. In, and, you know, it turns out that one of the, uh, that, that one of the mechanisms is in need, some connection to a cause larger than ourselves. That's manifestly what this is. And I think it also gives us uh, more perspective. And, you know, there, there are some practitioners uh, here, and I bet you will relate to this last story that I want to leave you with. Um, it's about a friend of mine who uh, is an aid worker, young American woman, and um, she's worked in some incredibly difficult places. I met her in Darfur, where she was unbelievably tough and strong, saw things no human being should ever have to see, and just never flinched, never broke down. And she came back over Christmas uh, break and was visiting her grandmother here in the US. She's in her grandmother's backyard, and she totally breaks down. She just loses it. She's weeping on the ground. And you know what it was? Um, her grandmother had a bird feeder in the backyard. And my friend thought about how she had just come from a place where people were throwing babies on a bonfire is because of the color of their skin and the tribe they belonged to. And how she had had the unbelievable good luck to be born in a country where we take security essentially for granted and where we also have the extra resources so we can not only feed and clothe and house ourselves but also help make sure that wild birds get through the winter okay. She just saw her life in a new perspective, her good fortune in a new perspective and with it the responsibility that comes with it. And at the end of the day for all of us, in a sense, we have won the lottery of life. And the question becomes how we then go about discharging that responsibility. So I hope you will join uh, this movement, uh, gain a new perspective, become happier in doing it, and help change the world. <laughs> Thanks so much.